welcome back, beautiful people. I am Sarah Sati. Perhaps you know that already if you joined before, and this is our final session of the second book club series that I've done. I think this one has been much more successful than the last, although both the books were quite um, beautiful books. Today uh, is our very final session of this section, and if you've been with me so far, then you know that we've actually already finished the book. Um, so why are we having this final session? Well, at the very end of the book is uh, the root text that the book was based on. And so today I'll offer an opportunity to just simply recap our journey together so far, and then I will read the root text. And this is uh, essentially a transmission where there's not really much you need to do to engage with that reading. It's really just an opportunity to listen. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then I'll offer a closing practice, a small closing practice and an announcement about our um, next book club, because I already have the next book club uh, set and the book selected, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite books. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that. But before we begin, let's start with setting our motivation. And this is something that we do every session and we'll continue to do with book clubs moving forward. Just an opportunity to bring our mindsets into the space that we're in and set our perspective for our time together. So however you are is perfectly fine, but if you'd like to take a moment here to find a more meditative posture, then please adjust yourself now and get out any last minute fidgets or movements. Perhaps you wanna move around just a little bit to find stillness. And then coming to a place of stillness, take a few moments here to settle the mind. And just like the body may have some excess energy that it needs to get out at the beginning, you have to move it around a little bit. The mind may also need to move a little bit more before it settles. So if you're observing that experience, the mind gets a little more active, that's no problem. Just simply rest yourself very naturally, allowing the mind to move if it needs to, and trusting that when the energy is expressed, it will come to a place of rest. And perhaps it feels good to take a few deeper, more complete breaths here, inhaling and exhaling in a way that feels good for you. And sometimes extending the exhalation or placing more emphasis on the exhalation can be helpful in coming to rest. but it's your practice, so whatever is best for you is perfect. And then take a moment now to bring your motivation to mind. What is it that brings you to book club today? Or perhaps you've come to every session or watched every recording. Just check in with yourself for a moment. Why is it you find this valuable? What makes you come to these sessions? And just remember that motivations can arise in many different ways. For some people, you look at your motivation and a word comes up or a thought 
For other people, you just may have a felt sense, a physical body sensation. And for some, you may see images, colors, lights. And other people may experience nothing at all. And there is no right or wrong way to experience this practice. You're just simply checking in, why am I here? Why do I come? And whatever arises is completely allowed and fully acceptable. And if you're like most people, if an answer did arise, likely regardless of its unique manifestation, the answer can be broken down to one of two reasons you are here today. The first reason being to be free from suffering, to feel bad less. And the second reason, to be happy more, to feel better more. And so you can check now. I'm suggesting here that whatever the unique presentation of your motivation is, it can really be boiled down to wanting to be happy more and to be unhappy less. Is this true? Just check. And perhaps ask yourself the question, is this everyone's wish? Does everyone wish to be happy more and suffer less? And then dropping the reflection, Let's give rise to a shared motivation here. You can just simply listen or you can repeat the words after me. May the work we are now about to begin. May the work we are now about to begin. Meet with ever growing fulfillment and success. Meet with ever growing fulfillment and success. And bring good fortune, prosperity, happiness, and peace. And bring good fortune, prosperity, happiness, and peace to ourselves and others. To ourselves and others. And just be with this for a moment this motivation, giving rise to the mind of bodhicitta. The mind of absolute compassion. The absolute desire to be free from suffering, not just for yourself, but for all of humanity. And then you can let go here. If your eyes have been closed, gently open them, bringing yourself back into our shared space. So, this is our final session, as I've said already, and I want to just check in briefly about the homework. We've had two weeks since our last session. Our last session, we dealt with the concept of bodhicitta, and we practiced tonglen, this idea or practice of sending and receiving, um, this way of imagining that we are taking suffering from ourselves and other beings on the planet and transforming it into ultimate well-being and sending it back out. 
So the homework was to work with an engaged bodhicitta practice of Tonglen throughout our time between sessions. So hopefully some of you who did participate in the last session had an opportunity to do that and felt some sort of benefit in some ways. Um, I talked a little bit about it can be sometimes scary to take in the suffering of others. There are those of us who I perhaps identify as being an empath, already quite sensitive to the pain and suffering of others. And just a reminder that Tung Len and Bodhicitta in general are arising from a deeper understanding when we're approaching them through the teachings of the Buddha in that they are arising from an understanding of the nature of reality, of reality as it is. And when we develop a deep understanding of reality as it is, we recognize a few very important things that transform our relationship to experience. Those things are emptiness, the fact that nothing has inherent independent existence, and also interdependent or codependent origination. And these two are really two sides of one coin. Nothing has an inherent existence. And in that way, nothing exists independent of anything else. Everything is dependent upon other causes and conditions. This is a conceptual framework for viewing reality, and it can be really easy to keep it in the space of conception, thinking about it more than practicing it. And that is why we talked about the idea of aspirational bodhicitta versus engaged bodhicitta. We want to take these concepts out of the mind, and we want to begin to embody them and engage with them in our waking life separate from our formal meditation practice so that we can start to check. Remember, Buddhism is not about being told what is true, but it is rather an invitation to investigate truth for ourselves. So we apply these concepts in our lives in such a way that they allow us to check for ourselves. Is this true? Is this real? And when we approach life from this new conceptual framework, this alternative way of viewing reality, do we reduce our suffering? Do we increase our lasting happiness? And that's what this book has been about all along, right? In this book, Transforming Problems into Happiness, we have been approaching one of the Lojong or mind training teachings, perhaps the most important one for the benefit of ourselves and others. We have been approaching it with both our thinking mind as well as our engaged embodied experience. And we've been doing this not just through listening, that's really the use of the thinking mind, this idea of asp our aspiration to transform our mind state, but then I've been offering practices each week to help us bring this into our life experience and check, like, is this mind training practice really benefiting me? And so I did this in a few ways, offering some different homeworks. Um, and if you haven't practiced, if this is maybe your first session or you've just been listening, I really invite you to go back and re-listen to at least the reading and the homework offer, and then to begin to look at how you can apply these in your lives. Because we only really see the benefit when we bring it into an embodied, engaged activity. Otherwise, we can just imagine the benefit. But it's one thing to like imagine making a million dollars, and then it's another thing to go out and do the work required to make a million dollars, right? So I can spend all my life in my mind just imagining what it would be like to have that million dollars and never get it. And actually, all I'm doing is perpetuating my suffering because I'm living two separate lives. Or I can go out and put to practice what it takes to make that million dollars. And that is what I am offering you here. We are first imagining that viewing our problems as benefits can improve our life circumstances and lead to lasting happiness. But then we are checking that because we do not want to continue living a disembodied life experience 
We want to become fully integrated beings where how we think and perceive reality is also how we act inside of the world. And when these two things come together, our perception of reality and our actions inside of reality, we necessarily experience less suffering. So the last homework I offered was an engaged practice, working with Tong Len inside of our life experience. So just like being at the grocery store and seeing someone, um, perhaps the checker and imagining that just like you, they suffer and then breathing in their suffering and sending them well-being. And you could do this anywhere, anytime. And before that, we talked about the paramitas, these six perfections in Buddhism, the session before that. And these six per per perfections are generosity, uh, ethical conduct, patience, concentration, diligence, and wisdom. And I offered the opportunity to choose just one and apply it really diligently inside of your life, like all day for the time between sessions to practice patience um, or all day for the time between sessions to practice generosity. And then the session before that, we looked at the concepts of desire and anger or attachment and aversion. And the offering was to really check inside of life between sessions how it is that aversion and attachment or desire and anger are leading to unnecessary suffering in our lives. And then the two sessions before that, our first and second session, we dealt with looking. If I'm going to change my perception of problems from being problems to problems as being benefits, can I actually do that? So spending the time between sessions, have any time a problem arises, looking at that problem as delicious and yummy as ice cream, as um, Rinpoche gives us the instruction for. And then the very first session, if you can remember all the way back, was looking at our current definition of happiness. How do we currently define happiness in our lives? And asking ourselves, is this definition truly leading to lasting happiness or not? And if not, thinking about how we may redefine happiness so that we are more likely to experience lasting happiness. Ooh, so it was a lot of work. I mean, I think we've had, this is our sixth session. So it's not so many sessions, but it was quite a lot packed into them. And even though it's a, a very short book, um, we'd call it perhaps pithy in Buddhism. The instructions are quite simple, but the implications for how those simple instructions will affect our lives are quite large. And the effort to use those instructions in our lives is actually quite difficult. You can just think for a moment of a time in your life right now, perhaps quite recently, where a problem came up, a problem that you view as a problem. And it can be something very small, like somebody charged you the wrong amount at the store for an item that you purchased, or um, your neighbor parked in front of your in your front of your mailbox or your garbage cans, um, making it more difficult for you to access your home or something you need. I mean, it doesn't have to be a big thing. But when we look at even a small thing in our lives and we say, when that event happened, how am I immediately responding to that event? Most of us can say it's often a little dull. We're not responding with wisdom. We're often responding with some level of ignorance. And we're often allowing very insignificant, very small irritations to transform themselves into bigger problems in our lives. So that for instance, when we're doing something that we consider important and someone who loves us interrupts us and that causes an irritation, we can easily allow that small irritation to grow into a much larger problem and cause ourselves endless amounts of increased and unnecessary suffering. And so this book has been all about changing that. Absolutely 100% 
changing that. If you remember all the way at the beginning of this book, Lama Zopa Rinpoche tells us, we are never going to be free of problems. Never. Never. People are always going to interrupt us. People are always going to do things we don't like or that we consider unwise. We are always going to do things that other people may consider irritation or unwise, unless unless we take on the mind of wisdom. And this mind is not a special mind we have to go to school for and pay money for to acquire. It's actually our innate given mind state, and it's simply covered by the wrong perspectives. So these six sessions, they can maybe seem meaningless, but they are not entertainment. This was not entertainment. This was serious business. In A Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, Shanti Deva, I think, tells this story about somebody who's walking on the earth and there's um, thorns and sticks and things that poke their feet. And so the question becomes, I can either cover the whole earth in leather or I can make a good pair of shoes. You have to ask yourself, if you're really interested in studying Buddhism, if you're really interested in gaining access to the benefits of studying and practicing the practices of the Buddha, and that doesn't mean you need to become a Buddhist, right? We don't need to become a nutritionist to use nutrition science, but we do need to take it seriously. We can't just view it as entertainment. We have to come in and when it hurts and when it's hard, we have to practice we have to take responsibility for ourselves. That is the ultimate practice. We have to make our own pair of shoes. We can't cover the earth in leather. It's impossible. And all it will do is perpetuate our own suffering and the suffering of the people around us. So when we begin to practice Buddhism, what we are essentially doing is we are becoming absolutely responsible for our own lives. We are saying, I am responsible for me. And how do we do that? We do that by affecting our mind state. We do that by working to transform the areas of our mind that lead to unnecessary suffering into areas of our mind that lead to lasting happiness. And that is exactly what Lama Zopa Rinpoche offers us in this text an opportunity to see that we have the power to transform our suffering, not to get rid of it, to transform it into a benefit. And that by simply doing that, our entire lives will change. And if you've done any of the practices, then you've seen it already. And you may also know, right? It's quite difficult. Something happened um, the other day. Maybe I told this story the last session, but I was at the DMV. I'm in the United States right now, and I had to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles. And if you've been there, it's a tragic place. It's like totally depressing. And somebody cut in line um, because it's a long line and you're waiting a long time. And I felt it, this pain, the pain. It's a physical pain. It feels like a physical pain of wanting to be upset. And what did I do? I heard that pain like a bell ringing and it was inviting me to become more patient. It was so hard, it was so hard. But I, I said to myself, I literally say in my mind, yes, I want this. I truly, authentically, if you know me personally, you know, I could cry about it right now. I truly, authentically, with all of my being, want to transform every negative emotion I have into wisdom for the benefit of humanity. That's truly a mission I'm on in my life. So when that pain comes, it is a gift. It is an opportunity. And I say, ooh, this pain, oh, it hurts. But the minute I look at it and the minute I see that it hurts and I recognize that it's actually nothing, it's just a mindset. 
it becomes funny. It lightens. It becomes a little looser. And that loosening is exactly the loosening necessary to find the space to open to the quality of patience that exists within me. I don't have to buy patience. I have it already. I just have to find it inside this really full closet covered with all these old clothes. To use a closet analogy, because I have way too many clothes. <laughs> Even though I have very few things, I have so many clothes. It's ridiculous. Okay, let's read. So I'm going to read the root text today. And um, I just want you to absorb it. You can chill in a comfortable posture. You can lie down. Don't worry about listening. You know, don't be like, am I listening or not listening? Don't stress yourself. Be very loose and free here. Find comfort. Maybe you're listening on your headphones and you're out on a walk. That's perfect. You know, actually, that's a great thing to do. I often listen to teachings and books um, while I'm running and my mind is just focused. It's there and my body energy has something to do so it isn't annoyed. So if you're walking, beautiful. If you're lying down, beautiful. There's no, no right or wrong thing to be doing here. Just listen. This is going to be a recap of everything we've learned so far in these past six sessions or five sessions before this. It is the root text, Instructions on Turning Happiness and Suffering into the Path of Enlightenment by Jigme Tempe Nima. Homage to Arya Avalokiteshvara through the recollection of his virtues, which are celebrated thus. He who is always happy because of the happiness of others and extremely distressed by the suffering of others, who has achieved the quality of great compassion, he renounces caring about his own happiness and suffering. I'm going to write a brief instruction on accepting happiness and suffering as the path of enlightenment. It is the most priceless teaching in the world and a useful tool for a spiritual life. The way of accepting suffering as the path to enlightenment by means of relative truth. Whenever affliction comes to you from beings or inanimate objects, if your mind gets used to perceiving only the suffering or the negative aspects, then even from a small negative incident, great mental pain will ensue. For it is the nature of indulging in any concept, whether suffering or happiness, that the experience of this happiness or suffering will thereby be intensified. As this negative experience gradually becomes stronger, a time will come when most of what appears before you will become the cause of bringing you unhappiness, and happiness will never have a chance to arise. If you do not realize that the fault lies with your own mind's way of gaining experience, and if you blame external conditions alone, then the ceaseless flame of negative deeds, such as hatred and suffering, will increase. This is called all appearances arising in the form of enemies. You should thoroughly understand that the reason living beings in the quarreling age are afflicted by suffering is fundamentally related to the weakness of their discriminative mind. Thus, being invincible against obstacles, such as enemies, illnesses, and harmful spirits, does not mean that you can drive them away so that they will not recur. Rather, it means that they will not be able to arise as obstacles to the pursuit of the path of enlightenment. In order to succeed in using suffering as the support of the path, you should train yourself in the following two ways. Reject the state of mind of exclusively desiring not to have suffering. Develop again and again the conviction that it is useless and harmful to feel anxiety and to dislike suffering by regarding it as totally unfavorable. Then, again and again, with strong determination, think, from now on, whatever suffering comes, I shall not be anxious and gain experience of that. One, the uselessness of considering suffering as something unfavorable. If you can remedy the suffering, then you don't need to be unhappy. If you cannot remedy it, then there is no benefit to being unhappy. Two, the great harm of considering suffering as something unfavorable. If you do not feel anxious, your strength of mind can help you to bear even greater sufferings easily. They will feel light and insubstantial like cotton, but anxiety will make even small sufferings intolerable. 
For example, while you are thinking of a beautiful girl, even if you try to get rid of desire, you will only be burnt out. Similarly, if you concentrate on the painful characteristics of suffering, you will not be able to develop tolerance for it. So as it is said in the instructions on sealing the doors of the sense faculties, your mind should not fasten on the negative characteristics of suffering. Instead, you should gain experience in keeping your mind in its normal condition and remaining in its own state, developing the attitude of being happy that suffering arises. This is the practice of cultivating joy when suffering arises by regarding it as a support to the path of enlightenment. To apply this practice to your life, whenever suffering arises, you must have a training in a virtuous practice according to the ability of your mind. Otherwise, if, having merely a theoretical understanding, you think, if I have certain skillful means to apply, the sufferings could bring this or that benefit, it will be difficult for you to achieve the goal. For as it is said, the goal is farther than the sky from the earth. One, suffering as the support of training in the mind of emergence from samsara. Think, as long as I am wandering powerlessly in samsara, the arising of suffering is not an injustice, but is the nature of my being in samsara. Develop revulsion towards samsara by thinking, if it is difficult for me to bear even the little sufferings of the happy realms, then how can I bear the sufferings of the lower realms? Alas, samsara is an endless and bottomless ocean of suffering. With these thoughts, turn your mind to liberation. Two, suffering is the support of training and taking refuge. Training and taking refuge by developing a strong belief and thinking the three precious jewels are the only unbetraying refuges for these endangered, for those endangered by these kinds of fears throughout their succession of lives. From now on, I will always depend on the refuge, and I will never renounce them in any circumstances. Three, suffering as the support of training in overcoming pride. Eliminate your pride and contempt for others which are inimical to gaining any merit. By realizing, as discussed earlier, that you don't have any control over your own destiny and that you have not transcended the enslavement of suffering. Four, suffering as the support for purification of unvirtuous deeds. Think carefully. The sufferings I have experienced and other sufferings that are more unimaginably numerous and severe than those I have experienced are all solely the results of unvirtuous deeds. Think carefully about this with regard to the four following aspects. The certainty of the process of karma, the tendency of karma to increase greatly, that you will not encounter the result of what you have not done, that the effects of what you have done will not be wasted. You should also think, if I do not want suffering, I should renounce the cause of suffering, which is unvirtuous deeds, in this way, purify your previously accumulated and virtuous deeds by means of the four powers and try to refrain from committing them again in the future. Five, suffering as the support for attraction to virtue. Think long and carefully. If I desire happiness, the opposite of suffering, I should try to practice its cause, which is virtue, and practice virtuous deeds through various means. Six, suffering as the support for training in compassion. Think about other living things who are also tortured by as much, if not more, pain as you are and train yourself by thinking how good it would be if they too became free from all suffering. By this method of thinking, you will also understand the way of practicing loving kindness, which is the intention to help those who are bereft of happiness. Seven, taking suffering as the support for the meditation that others are dearer than oneself. Think. The reason I am not free from suffering is that I've been caring only about myself from beginningless time. Now I should practice caring only about others, the source of virtue and happiness. It is very difficult to practice taking suffering as the path of enlightenment when you actually come face to face with difficult situations. So it is important to become familiar in advance with the trainings of virtue that are to be applied when unfavorable circumstances arise. Also, it makes a great difference if you apply a training in which you have clear experience. Furthermore, it's not enough merely for suffering to become the support of virtuous training itself. 
you have to realize that the suffering has actually become the support of the path. And then you must feel a strong and stable stream of bliss, which is brought about by that realization. For any of the foregoing categories of training, you should think just as the suffering I have undergone in the past has greatly helped me achieve happiness in many significant forms. The joy of high realms and liberation from samsara, which are all difficult to obtain, so too the suffering I am now undergoing will also continue to help me to attain these same results. So even if my suffering is severe, it is supremely agreeable. It is like a molasses dessert mixed with cardamom and pepper. Think about this again and again and cultivate the experience of bliss of the mind. By training in this way, the overwhelming nature or superabundance of mental bliss makes the sufferings of the sense faculties as if they were imperceptible. Thus, having a mind that cannot be hurt by suffering is the characteristic of those who overcome illness by tolerance. It should be noted that, according to this reasoning, this would also be the characteristic of those who overcome other obstacles as well, such as antagonists and evil spirits. As mentioned above, the reversing of the thought of dislike for suffering is the foundation of turning suffering into the path of enlightenment because while your mind is disturbed and your courage is extinguished by anxiety, you will not be able to turn your suffering into the path. Also, by training in the actual taking suffering as the path of enlightenment, you will improve the previous training, that is the reversing of the thought of dislike for suffering. Because as you actually experience an increase in virtues through suffering, you will, go in, you will grow increasingly courageous or cheerful. It is said, if you gradually train yourself through small sufferings, by easy, gradual stages, as the saying goes, you will ultimately be able to train yourself in great sufferings also. So according to this instruction, you should train gradually because it will be difficult for you to gain any experience beyond the scope of your present mental capacity. In the intervals between meditation periods, you should pray to the unexcelled three precious jewels so that you will be able to turn suffering into the path. Then when your mental strength has grown a little, making offerings to the three precious jewels and spirits and implore them saying, in order that I may gain strength in the practice of virtuous trainings, please send me unfavorable circumstances. You should maintain the confidence of blissfulness and cheerfulness on all occasions. When you are first learning this training, it is important to keep mundane diversions at a distance. For amid such diversions, you may become susceptible to the many negative influences of your companions asking you, how can you bear suffering and contempt? The flurry of worries caused by adversaries, relatives, and wealth could defile and disturb your mind beyond control and cause bad habits. There are also various other distracting circumstances that could overpower your mind. In solitary places where these distractions are not present, the mind will be very clear, so it will be easy to concentrate on virtuous things. For this reason, even the Chud practitioners, when meditating on stepping on or controlling suffering, at first should avoid practicing near the harmful actions of men or amid worldly diversions. Instead, they train mainly with the apparitions of gods, positive spirits, and demons, negative spirits, in solitary cemeteries and power spots. In brief, you should prevent attitudes of dislike toward internal illness, external antagonists, evil spirits, and unharmonious speech from arising, not only in order to make your mind impervious to misfortune and suffering, but also to bring bliss to your mind from the vicissitudes themselves. You should accustom yourself to generating only the feeling of liking them. To do this, you should cease to view harmful circumstances as negative and should make every effort to train yourself to view them as valuable because whether things are pleasing or not depends on how your mind perceives them. For example, if a person is continuously aware of the faults in worldly pursuits, then, if his retinue and wealth increases, he will feel all the more revulsion toward them. On the other hand, if a person perceives worldly pursuits as beneficial, he will even aspire to increase his majestic power. By practicing this kind of training, your mind will become gentle, your attitude will become broad, you will become easy to be with, you will have a courageous mind. 
your spiritual training will become free from obstacles. All bad circumstances will arise as glorious and auspicious. Your mind will always be satisfied by the joy of peace. To practice the path of enlightenment in this quarreling age, you must never be without the armor of this kind of training. When you are not afflicted by the suffering of anxiety, not only will other sufferings disappear like weapons dropping from the hands of soldiers, but in most cases, even the real negative forces, such as illness themselves, will automatically disappear. The holy ones of the past said, by not feeling any dislike toward or discontent about anything, your mind will remain undisturbed. When your mind is not disturbed, your energy will not be disturbed, and thereby other elements of the body will also not be disturbed. Because of this, your mind will not be disturbed, and so the wheel of joy will keep revolving. They also said, as birds find it easy to injure horses and donkeys with sores on their backs, evil spirits or negative forces will easily find the opportunity to harm those whose nature is fearful. But it will be difficult to harm those whose nature is stable or strong. Learned people realize that all happiness and suffering depend on the mind and therefore seek happiness from the mind itself. They understand that because the causes of happiness are complete within us, they are not dependent on external sources. With this realization, no matter what the afflictions, whether from beings or physical matter, they will not be able to hurt us. The same strength of mind shall also be with us at the time of death. We will always be free from the control of external afflictions. The meditative absorption of bodhisattvas known as overpowering of all elements by happiness is also accomplished by this means. Instead of seeking happiness within their minds, foolish people chase after external objects, hoping thereby to find happiness. But the pursuit of any worldly happiness, whether great or small, presents those people seeking it with many failures, such as they're not being able to attain it, to associate with it, or to keep it in balance. For such foolish people, as a proverb says, control is in the hands of others, as if their hair were tangled in a tree. Enemies and robbers will find it easy to harm these foolish people. Even a little criticism will drive happiness away from their minds. Their happiness will never be reliable, but will be as when a crow nurses a baby cuckoo. However much the crow nurtures the baby, it will be impossible for the baby cuckoo to become a baby crow. When such is the case, there will be nothing that is not tiresome for the gods, positive forces, miserable for the demons, negative forces, and suffering for them, the foolish people. This heart advice is the condensation of a hundred different crucial points in one. There are many other instructions, such as how to accept the hardship of asceticism for practicing the path, and how to turn illness and harmful effects into the path, as taught in the Zhiche teachings and so on. But here I've just written an easily understandable outline on accepting suffering as a support based on the teachings of Shantideva and his learned followers by means of absolute truth. This is how to draw your mind to dwell contemplatively in supreme peace, the natural state of emptiness in which unfavorable circumstances or even their names cannot be found and how it is realized by means of reasoning, knowledge, such as the refutation of the arising of phenomena from any of the four extremes. Even when you are out of that contemplative state, you should overcome unfavorable circumstances by seeing them as being hollow, mere names, and as not arising in the manner that feelings of suffering arose in your mind when fear and intimidation occurred in the past the way of taking happiness as the path to enlightenment by means of relative truth. If you slip under the control of happy circumstances or things that cause happiness, you will become proud, arrogant, and complacent, and this will obstruct your path toward enlightenment. But it is difficult not to fall under the sway of happiness, for as Padampa says, men can bear great suffering, but only a little happiness. Therefore, consider how all the various phenomena of happiness and their sources are impermanent and full of suffering. Make efforts to develop a strong revulsion toward them and to turn your mind away from careless behavior. Again, you ought to think all the wealth and happiness of the world are insignificant and are linked with much harm. Nevertheless, some of it has value, as the Buddha says. For a person whose freedom is impaired by suffering, it is very difficult to achieve enlightenment but it will be easy for a person to achieve enlightenment if he is in comfort. 
It is my great good fortune to have the opportunity to practice Dharma and happiness. Now I must buy Dharma with this happiness, and from the Dharma will happiness arise continuously. So I should train in making Dharma and happiness each other's support. Otherwise, like boiling water in a wooden pot, the final outcome will be the very same as what it was in the beginning. Thus, you should achieve the essential goal of life by uniting whatever happiness and joy arises with Dharma. This is the view of Nagarjuna's precious garland. If you are happy but do not recognize it, your happiness will not become the instrument of Dharma training, and you'll be wasting your life with the hope of a separate happiness. Therefore, as the antidote to the hopes for having a separate happiness, you should apply appropriate methods among the trainings given above and should possess the ambrosia of contentment. There are other ways to take happiness as the path, such as those based on the instructions on training in bodhicitta and on remembering the kindness of the three precious jewels. For the time being, however, this much is sufficient. Further, in order to accept happiness as the path, as explained in the case of suffering, you should alternate the trainings of purification with the accumulation of merit in a solitary place by means of absolute truth. You should understand it. The way of accepting happiness as the path by means of absolute truth, by the training given earlier, that is the training on suffering. If you cannot practice Dharma because of sorrow when you are suffering, and if you cannot practice Dharma because of your attachment to happiness when you are happy, then it will be impossible for you to have a chance to practice Dharma. So if you practice Dharma, there is nothing more essential than this training. If you have this training, whatever kind of place you stay in, whether in a solitary place or a city, whatever the friends you associate with, whether good or bad, in whatever situation you find yourself, whether in riches or poverty, happiness or sorrow, whatever conversations you hear, whether praise or condemnation, good or bad, you will never be afraid that it might diminish you. Thus, this training is called the lion-like training. Then whatever you do, your mind will be at ease and relaxed. Your attitude will be pure. Your final accomplishments will be excellent. Even though physically you're living in this impure land, your mind will be enjoying the glory of inconceivable bliss like the bodhisattvas of the pure lands. As the Kadampa Lamas say, by means of such training, happiness will be brought under control and suffering will be ended. If you are alone, it will be the companion of sadness. If you are sick, it will nurse you. Goldsmiths purify gold by melting it and make it flexible by rinsing it in water again and again. It is likewise with the mind. If by taking happiness as the path, you develop ardent desire for the practices of the Dharma, and if by taking suffering as the path, you cleanse your mind, then you shall easily attain the extraordinary meditative absorption that makes your mind and body capable of accomplishing what you wish. I can see that this training is the most profound method for perfecting moral discipline, the root of the virtues. Because it generates non-attachment to happiness, the foundation of the extraordinary moral discipline of renunciation is established. Because it generates freedom from the fear of suffering, it makes the discipline pure. As it is said, giving is the basis of moral discipline. Patience is the cleanser of moral discipline. By training this way, now when you reach the higher stages of the path, your attainments will come about as it is said. Bodhisattvas realize that all phenomena are like Maya, and they see that their births in samsara are like entering a joyful garden. Therefore, either at the time of prosperity or decline, they will not experience the danger of either emotional defilements or suffering. Here are some illustrations from the life of the Buddha. Before attaining enlightenment, he renounced the universal rulership as if it were straw and sat by the, the Nairanja Jana River with no concern for the harshness of the austerities that he was practicing. This indicates that the, the development of equal taste of happiness and suffering was necessary for him to achieve the ambrosia that is full enlightenment. After the Buddha attained enlightenment, on the one hand, the chiefs of human beings and gods up to the highest realms placed his feet on the crowns of their heads 
and offered him respect and service for all his needs and comfort. On the other hand, the Brahmin Bharad, Bharad Vaja abused him with a hundred allegations. A Brahmin's daughter slandered him with accusations of sexual misconduct, and he lived on rotten horse fodder for three months in the country of King Agnidatta, and so forth. Yet throughout all these, the Buddha remained without any alternations of mind, excitement, or depression, just like Mount Sumeru, which cannot be moved by the wind. This indicates that it's necessary to develop equal taste of happiness and suffering in order to act for the benefit of living beings. It is appropriate for this teaching to be taught by those who are like the Lord Kadampas, who have a history of not crying when there is suffering and of not and of having great revulsion towards samsara when there is happiness. If a man like me teaches it, I'm afraid that my own tongue will have contempt for me. But with my goal of achieving the habit of equal taste of the eight worldly affairs, I, the poor old man, Tempe Nima, have written this in the forest of many birds. I know, I know you want your life to be good. Just showing up here right now, just listening is that it is just that it is just you wanting your life to be good and that's the wish everyone has it's the wish everyone has and yet for some reason we keep suffering why is it necessary? The Dharma says no. But we don't just blindly believe it. This is not based on blind faith. We check. We check. We listen and we check. We say, wait a minute. You're saying if I have no revulsion towards suffering, and I have no attachment towards happiness. I will be blissful. Is that true? Come on now. Is that really true? And then we check. We check it. And we just practice in small ways. We titrate exposure. We start little bits, small amounts. And we do it again and again and again. Small amounts. Over and over again. And we say, hey, I smiled at a problem today. And rather than irritated, I felt joyful. All right. Okay. Let me try it again. And then we try it with bigger and bigger problems. I'm traveling. I'm traveling um, quite a bit and spending quite a bit of time in a, a separate location from my daughter's father. And this sometimes brings up a lot of stress and, and I have to check with myself and I have to remember that I want this. The pain is the bell ringing. The pain is the bell ringing. So hear it and listen. And that is the conclusion of this book club. We made it to the end, but it's just the beginning for many of us. You don't have to practice anything else. You could take this book and you could practice just this practice for the rest of your life and it would be enough. On the other hand, you could listen to me or someone else or read for yourself thousands of books with thousands of methods and nothing could ever change. And that power is in your hands. You know, are you willing to practice? Are you willing to say, ooh, it hurts. I want it to be someone else's problem. I want it to be about something else outside of me. But I'm going to look inside and change there. And that doesn't mean we become complacent. It's not nihilism. 
We don't say nothing matters. At the same time, we don't say everything matters. We say, look, there's nothing wrong with good. There's nothing wrong with bad. They're equal. They're even. We've all had it happen that something appears to be good, but ends up causing us great suffering, like falling in love. <laughs> you know, we've all had this. This is not a unique to you experience. We've all had it happen that something that appeared very bad on the surface ended up in something very good in the end. If that's true, that bad can be good and good can be bad, in what way are the two different? And they're not, but it's not enough to think about it. We have to bring it into our lives. And why do we sit in formal meditation? Why is it that we can't just always bring it into our lives and just embody it? Formal meditation gives us a space to really check. I'm annoyed here. I want to get up. I don't want to be sitting. Okay. I can feel that. That's an experience. I'm having it. And we don't have to indulge it. We don't have to ignore it. We don't have to suppress it or deny it. Oh, I love this meditation. Mm, I'm feeling so good right now. Okay, that's another experience. All experiences are of one taste. And we're just looking at that. And we're asking, is this true? And we're checking again and again and again. So let's check for the last time together from this, this series of book club, the second series of book club. Let's just sit for a brief moment together before we close. Just adjust, find a good posture for you, a good meditative posture for you. Not too tight, not too loose, like holding a piece of paper. You know, if you squeeze that piece of paper, you crumple it. And if you don't hold it tight enough, you drop it. So somewhere in the middle of that. And then just rest, very natural. The eyes are open or closed, but the eye consciousness is free. It's open. Maybe you see things in the mind or not. And you're not straining to hear anything, but the ears are open. Sound can come and go. Touch, taste, smell, everything is open. Everything is allowed. Things can come and they can go. And you're just resting here, very natural. What comes is an experience and you know it comes. But the nature of experience is to end. And you know it ends. And that's the thing that never changes, that knowing quality. So find that and rest there. Experience comes and goes. Nothing stays the same, not even for a single solitary moment. Nothing, everything is always changing except knowing Just rest with that. Just a few moments here. Letting all experience be exactly okay, 100% perfect. And simply knowing that it's occurring.
stability. We recognize the nature of experience. We recognize the nature of awareness, the mind, of knowing. And when we rest in it, we are very stable. Take a few deep clearing breaths. And let go of the contemplation and just for a moment, think of all the people in the world who could benefit from these practices, from these teachings. Just for a few cycles of breath, breathe in and imagine you're taking away this false belief that problems are problems. You're just wiping it off the planet with each in-breath. And then with each out breath, send this practice out to every living being on this planet. And imagine you're opening your heart. Open your heart wide. Drop all stinginess. Give it all away. May all beings benefit from this practice. May the merit of this practice be dedicated to anyone at any time who suffers. May every human being awaken to the true nature of reality and find ultimate lasting joy. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. Thank you so much for your dedication to yourself and your commitment to exploring ways in which you may take greater responsibility for joy in your life. And that has endless benefit for all human beings on this planet, in the planet itself even. So it's really a, a gift. This concludes our second series in book club. And um, I will be offering another series beginning in just a few weeks. I keep thinking, am I going to start in October or will I start in September? I think I'll begin in September because, um, yeah, because I think I'm going going back to the Caribbean soon, but we'll see. I'll announce it soon, the exact date. But I can tell you already that I've selected the book and it's called Everyday Consciousness and Primordial Awareness by Thrangu Rinpoche. And this is a book that I really... Um, I hold very close to my heart. It's a very dear, dear, dear book to my heart. So I'm really excited to share it um, and jump back in. And in the meantime, I hope you keep practicing. I hope you keep working on engaging with life with these practices and through these practices. And I hope that they bring you benefit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Until next time.